This will be the first of three lectures on adaptations that prey have to avoid predation. So predators evolve traits to increase the ability to find prey, to then, once they find them, to attack prey, make that attack successful by capturing the prey, and then eventually, once they've captured the prey, uh, actually successfully eat them and consume them. Prey have counter-adaptations to those of the predators, and this sets up what we call a co-evolutionary arms race, where both of the uh, species in the interaction, the predator and the prey, are trying to stay one step ahead of the adaptations of uh, the other species. So predators are trying to find ways, uh, better adaptations for finding, attacking, capturing, and consuming prey, and the prey are trying to find better ways of hiding, preventing attack, preventing capture, and pre preventing actually being eaten. So let's first focus on, and we're going to take uh, this from the perspective of, of a prey species. How do you avoid being found? How do you reduce detection? Well, crypsis is one of the main adaptive strategies that prey species use. Cryptic morphology goes along with cryptic behavior. So let's use the example of nesting, ground nesting birds. Oftentimes they're very cryptic, meaning they have both camouflage eggs and nestlings as seen here in the shorebirds. The effect of this cryptic plumage can be uh, accentuated by certain behaviors. For example, yes, the outside of the egg is very well camouflaged, but as you can see here, the inside of the egg is bright white, and this could uh, be a signal to the location of the nest, a visual signal to potential predators. And so behaviorally, one of the adaptations you can have is the parents will remove these eggshells uh, from the, the nest. Many bird species also, the young produce their feces in little gelatin packets called fecal sacs, and the parents remove these from the area of the nest as well to reduce, reduce any olfactor, I mean, uh, yeah, olfactory signal associated with the nest. The nestling behavior itself can help to maintain crypsis associated with the nest. Um, they freeze when they hear an alarm call, or they can uh, freeze when they, they are tipped off to the presence of a potential predator. And the adult help to keep the location of the nest uh, hidden by using stealth when approaching the nest uh, to either incubate the eggs or to feed the young. Here's some examples of two uh, lizards. Actually, it could be the same lizard, but it's the same species. Uh, demonstrating that crypsis is very context dependent. This is an Australian lizard and you can see that the uh, photograph on the left pretty good camouflage. It really blends in well with the background of that substrate but you put them on another substrate and they stick out like a sore thumb. So crypsis, uh, another thing that maintains crypsis is be the ability to find the appropriate habitat so that crypsis will work and so that's where you bring in a behavioral component. One of the most classic studies uh, in, in this topic comes from salt and pepper moths in England. Um, insects very commonly have ca camouflage and they uh, help to make this camouflage work better by stasis or, or being still resting in appropriate locations. But as you can see by the salt and pepper moth, depending on the background the moths rest on, really determines the effectiveness of the different morphologies uh, found in the species. So in the top left figure here, we have a nice unpolluted woodland in England, and in this case, the salt and pepper lighter morphology is adaptive, and the melanistic dark morphology is maladaptive. So um, putting this in the context of predators, birds are oftentimes predators of these moths. Birds would much easier would find it much easier to find the melanistic moths and eat them, uh, and so there would be selection against that moth in this context. However, in a polluted woodland where there's lots of soot uh, covering the, the bark, and this is in the context uh, where, where these polluted woodlands used to exist before they've really been cleaned up uh, in recent years, 
was during the Industrial Revolution and a lot of coal-fired plants uh, caused the darkening of the tree trunks in certain areas. But in those areas, the melanistic form was much more cryptic, and the salt and pepper moth, the lighter moth, was the one that stood out. And so selection was for the melanistic ones and against the salt and pepper light ones in these polluted woodlands. The picture on the right basically just kind of shows you uh, in woodlands that are unpolluted but the trees have branch scarring that is dark. There's the potential for both forms to exist as long as they pick the appropriate locations to hang out. And so here you can see in these branch scar areas the dark moths do, do well um, and then the light moths uh, do better when they're uh, on the lighter bark areas, although this one's kind of overlapping into uh, a darker region as well. All right, these are some data associated with a uh, study of these melanistic and lighter colored salt and pepper moths in England. What they did is they looked at the different phenotypes and uh, demonstrated how they were advantageous in different environments. So uh, the x-axis is showing you the typical or lighter colored one versus the melanic or darker colored one. The uh, y-axis is actually showing the number eaten out of 50 presented. They actually put uh, pinned museum specimens out in each of these locations, 50 of each form, and then look to see which ones were attacked. And as you can see in the polluted woodland, the typical lighter form was attacked at a much higher rate than the melanic form. Um, this is, was regardless of the location, either the trunk or the limb joint, but you can see that particularly with the melanic form, um, location uh, in the limb joint, which is darker, was associated with reduced uh, predation rates. In the non-polluted woodland, we actually uh, have uh, the, the general pattern is the reverse. In uh, the, the uh, non-polluted woodland, the, the darker forms stood out more on the white trunks associated with the, the lichen-covered uh, tree and bark, and so they had higher predation rates. However, the melanic forms that did survive at a higher rate or had reduced number of attacks were the ones that were using these l darker limb joints. In a study where blue jays were trained to peck at a screen that either had a moth or didn't have a moth, they were actually rewarded when they pe pecked successfully at a screen that had a moth. Moths on natural backgrounds were seen uh, 10 to 20 percent less often by jays, uh, and they were overlooked the most when in the appropriate head up position. So, indicating that cryptic morphology again is more effective when it's uh, layered with appropriate behaviors. Now, you may be wondering how the, you would train a bird to do a study like this. One of the things that they, they did here, because you, if the bird just associates a picture coming up with when I peck it, I get food, that wouldn't work. So when they picked it in the right circumstance, they would get food when they actually saw a moth. But if there was not a moth in the picture and they pecked it, then they were punished. But they were punished in a fairly passive manner. What the punishment was, it just delayed the time in which the next slide was pre presented to them. And the birds learned very quickly then to be more selective and only peck at the screen when they could see a moth. Now sometimes animals will add to their crypsis, uh, not just with the, the natural um, body that they have, but add in environmental um, items to increase the cryptic effect. And here's an example of that with an assassin bug that collects debris uh, so that it can hide from approaching army ants. The chart on the left shows you uh, some results from a study in which they had three different groups. One group was just the natural um, assassin bug with its normal backpack of debris and a dust coating, and you can see that the number of bugs uh, that were attacked was zero, uh, and all the bugs were uh, ignored, so it was a very successful form of crypsis. If you begin to disassemble that uh, costume, 
this this disguise that they've created for themselves where you take away all of the larger elements and you only leave them with a coating of dust it still provides them with some protection so uh, more of them are being ignored but a substantial number about a third of them now are being attacked and if you basically remove all of that uh, debris uh, the attack rate increases and virtually all of them are attacked this is a skipper butterfly larva, and uh, one of the th threats that they face is actually from parasitoid wasp. These wasp will find these um, larvae and will actually lay their eggs inside of them so that when their young hatch, they actually eat the living larva. Obviously, that's something they want to avoid, uh, the caterpillars, the, the butterfly caterpillars. And one of the, the ways that the wasp find the caterpillars is by scent. And so the uh, caterpillars actually make these explosive feces pellets that they blow away from their body uh, at, at a great distance. And this was noted by entomologists, and they wondered exactly what that was. The hypothesis was that it reduced the odor uh, to, to reduce their predation rate. And so they did a really uh, nice uh, test of this where they collected some of the waste pellets, put them back into the little leaf uh, shelter that the butterfly hides in, which is another form of its hiding visually, you know, trying to, to, to hide in a leaf. Um, but if you add those waste pellets back, it should increase that scent. Well, they also used a control, which was glass beads that looked like these waste pellets, but uh, obviously didn't have the scent to just verify that it wasn't the, the presence, the visual uh, signal that could be associated with the waste pellets, but it was actually the scent. And so basically what you see is either you measure it by the number of visits by the parasitoid wasp or the time that the parasitoid wasp spend in association with the larva, um, the ones with the, the waste pellets were significantly higher than the ones with glass beads. Another thing you could do to reduce detection if you're a potential prey species is just to reduce your activity when the predators are going to be most active. So kangaroo rats, gerbils, scorpions, uh, nocturnal organisms, they uh, forage more on moonless nights uh, because when the moon is, is uh, out, that's when owls are, are most active. Behaviors like that, though, can be costly. If your crypsis is in large part dependent on stasis, basically not moving, well, that means you can't be foraging during that time period, you can't be courting a potential mates, and so uh, there, there's a, a fine line between the cost and the benefits of this behavior. And so you see individuals practice risk-prone behaviors, like foraging behavior, when they're starved. Or individuals uh, during the, the, the peak of uh, mating season might be more willing to take a risk-prone uh, strategy when courting a high-quality mate, uh, despite the increased uh, chances of, of uh, predation that might incur. So we're going to talk this semester about risk-prone versus risk-averse strategies. Um, in situations where you're pretty nice and healthy and fat anyway, and you're not really needing food right away, you would adopt a risk-averse strategy, especially if predators were uh, likely to be in the area. So a quick review. We basically demonstrated that cryptic morphology helps individuals hide from predators and that behaviors can make this type of adaptation even more effective. So by picking the appropriate habitat choice that, that makes the, the cryptic morphology work better, reducing activity and vocalizations when predators are seen, uh, these can all make cryptic uh, morphologies uh, more effective. Another way to reduce your chance of predation is by limiting your activity when predators are going to be most active. Uh, that's also adaptive. But again, that can come at a cost. Uh, long periods of inactivity limit your ability to feed and to mate. And so uh, depending on your state, uh, individuals, uh, as, as a potential prey species, you might ad adopt a risk-prone versus a risk-averse strategy.